Welcome to today's podcast interview. I brought on Dr. Kristen Lee. Dr. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Heather. It's great to be here. Please give listeners a little background. Where do you live and what do you do? Oh, so I am on the East Coast. I live in both Boston, Massachusetts and Providence, Rhode Island. So you might hear some of that accent happening in the interview today. Um, And I have the privilege of teaching behavior science at Northeastern University in Boston. And I also am a comedian and a writer. Good. And so I definitely want to, because I feel like a lot of times this science stuff can feel so heavy and overwhelming. And I would love to kind of dance with the comedian side of it. As an example, do you know Kyle Cease? I don't think so. So he's a formal, former Hollywood comedian, kind of turned more. He's described as a Jim Carrey meets Eckhart Tolle. Oh, nice. And I just love his presentation, how he makes this more light and fun. And, you know, I think getting out of that masculine energy and getting into the flow of life that we are not here to struggle and effort and die. Uh I would love to hear more from you on the side of the behavioral science. What exactly is that and how can we implement that in our life? Indeed, I, I'm obsessed with it. And I think it's just amazing. You know, all of us have a lot of opportunities in the modern world world to discover what helps us to thrive and flourish. And science has just made incredible advances. So for example, when we think about human emotions and human well-being, you know, we're not operating in the 1950s anymore. We're not making guesses around human behavior. Now we have more nuance and more expansive ways of thinking about it. So to color it in, uh, we know that our emotions are now being seen as pattern recognition. And, you know, we used to think, oh, our rational brain is in effect or our emotive brain, you know, our emotive side is having its way. But um, new research is showing that our well-being and our thought patterns really hinge on what's called a body budget. So how well rested, nourished, exercised, you know, how well we're taking care of ourselves impacts the how, how we can be subject to like, you know, just spirals in our thinking. And actually we need to tend to like those basic functions in ourselves. So I think that's really pivotal. It seems simple but it's also profound because in our culture that baits us to act like we're robots or machines and go, go, go. A lot of times we can skip over some of those really critical stools in our, in our like legs in our stool of self care, so to speak. I'd love to expand a little bit more on emotions. And I just want to ask you a question. What I have been told is that Mm -hmm. one, emotions are energy in motion. Emotions Mm -hmm. want to be felt and released. Mm -hmm. And as a society, especially think about, I have an older brother, you know, when you are young, boys are taught, don't cry, you know, boys don't cry. And so I feel that men have been conditioned to suppress their emotions. And that's why they have so much anger and guilt and resentment. And look, we were never taught how to fully express and Mm. something I had a coach of mine a couple of years ago, but something he shared with me was if we think about when our triggers, do you use that term? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would love for you to expand your background on triggers, but triggers are like a check engine light. Uh Can you talk more about emotions and triggers and what happens if we don't feel them? Because what he used to say is you've got to feel it to heal it. Mm. I think that's important. And I think you're making me think about cultural norms. So specifically in American culture, but not unlike other cultures across the world, um, there can be a lot of hesitation to lean in or acknowledge dark or difficult emotions. And they could be seen as bad or something that we stuff away or that we should feel shame towards. And ultimately, emotions are a response to what our brain thinks we should feel in a moment based on things that have happened before. So to your question around triggers, if again, our body budget has gone well below its threshold, or if we're just in a particular cycle, we might have been dealing with trauma, like so many have through the pandemic, 
and aftermath and ongoing peril, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like unique things that can be particularly challenging for us based on our own histories, our own variables and so forth. So I think the key thing um, for us all to think about as we think about our emotions is what are the things that can help regulate our emotions so we're less likely to fall for those triggers or get into those cycles of anxiety and wary and perseveration. I think for me, what I do, but I, I do my best to learn, um, live from a state of curiosity. So when I feel mm. triggered and I have a dog, she has been quite a gift for me. So she'll be uh -huh. for this October, but Zoe, I, I mean, I know I'm impatient, but having a puppy and now even she's a very hyperactive dog. Zoe is constantly triggering me, but at the same time, it's a huge gift. Cause it's like, okay, I'm still impatient. I uh -huh. still have unresolved anger or, or whatever that is. And I'm not going to take it out on Zoe. Zoe is just bringing that to light. And mm. uh, for me, it, I try to sit in a space of um, curiosity to acknowledge mm. it. What is this bringing up? And then I, I want to choose to release it. Mm. That is something I have talked myself through. Mm. I think that's really good wisdom, Heather. And I think um, you know, there's a lot that you just illustrated. One is like the people or the animals or the things we relish and we love and we're close with. It doesn't mean like it's always perfect and not provocative, right? Mm -hmm. Like we can get set off. And I think you're also speaking to a deeper point around emotional recovery in life because we all are accumulating trauma all the time um, in different ways. And I think it speaks to just how can we um, learn the skills and the habits and the mindsets that help us to nourish ourselves and mitigate that impact on ourselves. So as you know, in my work, I talk a lot about, you know, the idea that small things can make a big difference, bring big impact in our life. Mm -hmm. And I talk about microdosing, for example, um, how we can do that um, microdose bravery, for example, and, you know, be courageous and face our difficult emotions and face our triggers and what's provocative to us as people um, so that we can move to a better place over time, bit by bit. Um, and that's a piece, you know, you asked about the science. I'm obsessed with the science of behavior change because we can, you know, so many times I think we know, okay, I don't want to be triggered anymore. Or I don't want to um, like eat the cho whole chocolate cake, or I don't, or I want to get out and take a run, but I got sidetracked. So behavior change happens in small increments. I think that's key for anyone listening and, and viewing right now with us is this notion of think small because we live in a more is more world. Everything is grandiose. Everything is all dopamine up at every moment. Like, right. It's all like for show. And there's this whole thing, this whole amplification. And then when we're really, really stressed or we're marinating in anxiety or dealing with trauma and it's resulting triggers and symptoms, we can think, oh my gosh, I need to go away for like eight weeks to a Zen retreat, or I need to like go off the grid, or I need to cut every toxic person out of my life. Right. Yeah. Um, but we know like those things aren't necessarily possible for us. So I think a lot and write a lot about the small strategic things we can do um, to heal. And it's, it's really very strategic. It's not like, okay, I have to do this big thing because just like all those difficulties add up, so do our small steps towards resilience and change. I think that's something I would really like to highlight the behavioral, the micro dosing, small shifts, because even my clients have experienced that. I do believe you don't need these quantum leaps. You don't have to get up at four in the morning and stuff more into your day. My clients have found even very small shifts. Yes. As an example, yesterday I did a training on procrastination. Uh -huh. Supposedly 80% of adults admit to procrastinating. Uh -huh. And I, through a lot of research and found out, I mean, one, procrastination is a symptom of a much deeper rooted problem. Yes. 
But even for procrastination, what I shared with uh, the people on the call was how I got myself to stop procrastinating because it comes from fear, self-doubt, overwhelm, and much more. I did small things as an example to build a new habit. And this is why I want to hear it from you. For me, it was who hasn't done this, right? You gather the trash, put it at the top of the stairs and walk by it many times before you actually take it out. Mm -hmm. I started so small. I would literally, when I would gather the trash, I would just walk downstairs and put it in the trash can. I had to start with that small of tasks Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. follow through and completion to build the self-trust and confidence. I started Mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. And then now I don't get overwhelmed with big projects. I sit, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? I sit down, get clear, reverse engineer, whatever. Here's what I want to ask you and what I wrote down. Somebody shared yesterday. He was like, I know what I need to do, Mm -hmm. but I'm not doing it. Yeah. Who isn't in that boat? And so if, you know, from a behavioral science standpoint and these micro small changes, when you know what you need to do and you're still self-sabotaging, mm-hmm. how do we break that cycle? I think we have to be generous with ourselves and be self-compassionate. Mm-hmm. And like you said, who isn't in that boat? It's part of our shared humanity. And what we know from the research is that oftentimes when we stew in shame and regret and self-loathing, That does nothing to advance behavior change. And instead, if we look at ourselves in a more expansive, more humane way, if we have even, you know, again, self-compassion or empathy for ourselves and one another, we become less judgmental. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting at this moment in time, I find cancel culture very interesting. For example, I think that it can help hold accountability when someone is disparaging or oppressive or violent against human beings. But I also worry that it's very, um, there's sort of this like shame-based nature or this thing of like rubbing our noses in our own messes. It's this shame-based way is very Mm. punitive. And I think it furthers the damage that caused people to act in unhelpful and inhumane ways. So this isn't to make an excuse, let's say for behaviors or actions associated with racism or classism or sexism or homophobia or ageism or ableism or xenophobia. It's not, it's not giving a pass at all. Um, But what it, what I'm saying is that um, we need to see ourselves in context. We have to see the perils of life and we're living in a world that's so polarized and so radicalized. And there's so much money to be made on our collective disdain, you know, take a side and fight like endlessly. And I think that that is a detriment um, for us to be able to see our interconnectedness as humans and to find the goodness that exists within all of us. So whether we're trying to make changes in our own lives that will help make for ease, so to speak, and, and make things go smoother or we really want to see the world become more conscientious and more loving and less discriminatory. Um, again, those things don't happen in flip of switch or overnight, but they all, they don't happen if we stay stuck in a position of judgment, finger pointing, hatred, blame, loathing, et cetera. So I think for me, I would just say anyone listening, we need to all do that inventory around ways we might be able to unlearn the things that we have been, you know, really seared into our mind's eye Mm -hmm. and be able to look at things in a more loving, kind way um, towards ourselves and each other. Okay. So I love that term unlearn. And what it made me think is, you know, somebody might be asking, well, where would I even start? And I think for me, it was any space you're currently struggling dissatisfied that would be the place to start right I think that that is a great option I think that um I like how you talk to me about I know this about you that you're a curious person and you approach life with a lens of curiosity Mm -hmm. and I do think that sometimes that can get squelched like within formal school like within schools like 
I think we naturally have a lot of curiosity when we're younger and then that can shift. Or I think that in society, there's a lot of binaries. You're either on this side and you think exactly this way about every issue or it's the polar opposite, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it can start with a lens of curiosity and like, you know, kind of like, I wanna discover what will help me be positioned to contribute better in the world. You know, because, you know, as you and I have talked about before, there's this, I, I wrote about this in my recent book, Worth the Risk, there's this commodity complex at hand in society. It teaches us that we're robots, we're machines, we're puppets. We have to like follow this certain script. Mm -hmm. I think for all of us, we have to first know where the architects of our own experience. And this is called taking psychological agency, which is just a fancy way of saying we take the helm, we say, I don't know everything, but I want to be curious and I want to discover what is going to help me thrive and bring impact in this world. And I think a lot of times we're sidetracked by, oh, you know, I want the Tesla or the red bottom shoes or the letters after my name or the money in the bank. And we're sold these ideas of so-called success, these metrics. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately they lead us to great peril and dissatisfaction in our lives. Well, and consumerism in a materialistic society also teaches us that happiness is external. Yes. And we all know that that happiness is very fleeting. And then, I mean, I've even experienced it used to be a hundred dollar shopping spree. And then it, it raised <laughs> to, it was a thousand dollar shopping right. spree trying to fill that void. Right. Two words popped in my mind while you were sharing that one. And for me, you know, it was a space of humility, realizing mm -hmm. that maybe I don't know everything. Uh -huh. And that's again, why I become curious. And I've learned from so many different mentors mm -hmm. and why I do podcasting, because I want to hear other people's perspectives. Yes. The second word that came to mind was insanity. The uh -huh. definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting new results. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something that I blast on social often is kind of my headline is to get out of your own way. Uh -huh. And what I mean by that is one, you are the only one holding yourself back. I mm -hmm. believe that all lack and limitations and scarcity are self-imposed. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you to expand on, cause you, you kind of touched on it, but the whole being an architect of your own experience. Yeah. You know, we are the painters of our lives. I don't know who originally said this, but somebody said, and I should know this, you are the author, director, writer, and producer of your movie. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. like the current scene, write a new one. I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful sentiment. And I would say that it resonates for me and I agree in a lot of ways. My footnote or my addition would be this, that, um, and I talk about this in my TEDx talk, the risk you must take. I use the acronym, which like academics, we all love our acronyms, ASSIES, which is very like purposely, you know, like, so it stands for asinine societal and self-imposed expectations. And, you know, I kind of did it in jest, mm. but it really is saying based on my research around what helps us be resilient, what helps us take this agency in life and make meaning of things and get on our way, you know, be courageous even, um, is realizing how much our environments influence our behavior mm. and how much they affect our well-being. So, yes, I do agree that each of us, we can take agency and we can, you know, but I also worry sometimes like if it's just that, it feels very almost like reflective of living in an individualistic culture, like the bootstrap mindset, pull yourself by your bootstraps or like, you know, just like you do it. And I worry that sometimes if we only, that, that aspect isn't wrong or untrue, but it's also, and also we need to look at our social context and how problematic it is and look at the systemic isms and issues that are there that hurt us. And especially they hurt persons of color, LGBTQIA community, um, anyone who's been marginalized or underrepresented. And in that, I think 
that's the piece is like, if it's just by itself, like you can do anything, you can do it. I have kind of a disdain for like pop psychology or like motivational speakers who will say like, do these things because it's much more holistic and it's much. And I think when we contextualize it, then we can unlearn more readily. You know, we can say, you know, that, that whole thing that I've been taught was very damaging. And that actually like, you know, kind of like threw me into a state of perfectionism and hyper-performance and imposter syndrome and like just feeling like I'm never going to be enough. Yeah. And so I think that piece is like, yeah, I think part of the agency or the architecture or the painting, the new painting, ripping up the old script or like we're mixing metaphors here, but you know, it's like that redo, that restart involves saying, I reject this that's being sold for the benefit of people in power, right? They have a lot to gain if we subscribe to whether it's consumerism or, you know, other aspects, like they have a lot to gain because they stay in power and they keep feeding the machine. And I'm not trying to sound like conspiratorial or anything, Yeah. but I think that we are living in a reality where I mean, we could talk, I could be like, hey, Heather, I am thinking about um, buying a pair of these sneakers. And then I'd go on my feed two minutes and they would be there. So they kind of have us by the jugular, like marketers and even like social media, maybe it has some positive aspects for sure. And it's a way to stay connected and it has merits to it. But also now everything is a commercial, you know? And so I think it's just being really conscious of how do we extricate ourselves from our environment for one hot second and say, Oh, that's like some pretty bad sewage. We're like soaking in all the time. And like, how do we like cleanse ourselves from all that residue of things that are actually really just benefiting some and hurting many. Something I want to ask you, and I don't know why this is, this was coming up while you were talking there's two different scenarios but one when we're talking about this whole unlearning these societal norms or boxes that we've been taught as an example I quit corporate in 2017 Mm -hmm. I come from you know the old school my mom was a stay-at-home mom my dad worked for one company you know 40 years retired Mm -hmm. with a pension Mm -hmm. My parents sent me to college. You know, they did what we're conditioned to do. You need a a degree to work for corporate, a good job that pays benefits. That is the old paradigm. Uh And for me to step into what I'm doing, to be an entrepreneur, online coaching, definitely my dad was like, all right, that's a cute hobby. When are you going to get a job? And he didn't Uh specifically- A real job, right? Right. He didn't specifically say that. And I, again, this was a huge gift. I had to deal with or uncover and then realize I don't need my parents' permission to live life on my terms, to quote, be the architect of my own experience. Yes. And I had to get over myself of, okay, that was my dad's upbringing. And he, of course, wants the best for me, but that is not my vision and my dream. Mm. And a friend of mine was sharing a similar story last week that I think she sort of had her wake up call around 30 when she was going around trying to be what everybody wanted her to be, but it wasn't what she wanted to be. And she's not alone. Mm -hmm. So what would you offer to those people that have been quote, living someone else's dream when they have the ability to be the architect of their own experience? Mm. Uh, it's just profound. I really love your courage and your candor and you even, you know, just sharing, you know, what that process has been like for you to unlearn and uncouple from those expectations or like a paradigm that is outdated. And it's not that we're being critical of other generations, like of your parents' generation specifically. But I was thinking about this too, the other day, I mean, like life has just changed in such major ways and the opportunities that we have at this moment in time are unparalleled. Um, So in Worth the Risk, I wanna give an example of how I think of, you know, thought about this and wrote about it was, 
you know, I call it our foos, our family, another acronym, um, family of origin. Okay. And also sometimes I talk about communities of origin. So the families of origin are communities of origin. That's a very like psychotherapist term, family of origin, right? So for anyone that kind of wants to like pull out a cool thing at a dinner tonight, be like, my family of origin, <laughs> we like sound so therapeutic. But um, in all seriousness, um, our families of origin and communities of origin can teach us an extraordinary value set. Um, there can be all kinds of complexity. It can be like on one hand, there was so many values handed off and so much to appreciate, but the script that they have is invariably gonna differ from the one that's meant to be for you. Mm. And I think we do inherit a lot of um, expectations or beliefs that again, are just not the right fit. And so, yes, that first step is discovering mm, this fits, this doesn't, I can give myself permission. I'm going to reconfigure or just start with a blank slate and come up with a blueprint that fits my life. That really is very true. And another, you know, we're talking metaphorically, but a way to think about this in tangible terms as well is we need to be very clear about our values that we hold. And it's different for everyone. And once that clarity comes, that becomes a catalyst that informs our behavior. So to color it in real quick, for me, I have, you know, social change, social justice is very high for me. Um, one of my most held like highest, um, values that I discovered is my creativity and my art. Mm -hmm. And so as serious as I am, as much as I focus, I work with a lot of companies around the world around resilience, behavior change, creating healthy mental health cultures. I am involved like, and then with science, I'm involved like really serious topics, but I'm also very creative and I started performing comedy and have made that like a much more, it's a part of my identity, it's a part of my daily life now in that performing and, and what I'm doing in that space, it could seem like incongruent, like, wait, you do all this serious stuff and you're dealing with like really life-threatening situations in your work and like the heaviness of inequity and that like you can laugh, like it just seems like incompatible. Um, but I know that that value for me, that creative expression is really important. And I find that when I engage with it, it's extremely edifying and very helpful to me as a person. And so I wanna encourage everyone to reimagine, like be more expansive and think about, yes, you may have values that your families of origin or communities of origin imparted that were like beautiful and they don't need any tweak or revision whatsoever but then there might be a bunch that were left off and no one gets to tell you well you should care about this or if you don't go to a nine to five job you're not worthy like those things aren't for anyone else to define what i will say as a disclaimer because i do think and we might disagree on this i'm not sure or just have different ways to look at it but I think there is somewhat of a culture like of it, it almost makes it seem it romanticized entrepreneurship like that it's so easy like Ugh. it's easy to have a podcast or to start yeah. your own enterprise and I think yeah. people that don't do that don't know how difficult that can be or I think it's easy to just say all corporate structures or all these things we just need to like nix them all together and I think that everything has its place and everyone's circumstances are different. And I think that's important to recognize in conversations like this because sometimes it can get glamorized or convoluted. Um, and I think that it's just, again, how do we discover a path that is sustainable for us, that honors our values and that where we can bring a, an amazing contribution in the world. Yeah. You know, that's what helps people flourish, not, you know, someone else's idea of what it should be. I a hundred percent agree. And entrepreneurship is not for everyone. I call it personal development on steroids. 
I, you know, you have to have a lot of discipline. I, I wear a lot of hats. I've had to face mm-hmm. self-doubt, imposter syndrome, procrastination. I'm the only one holding myself back, uh-huh. but there is no ceiling. And so you're right. A hundred percent. I would never bash the nine to five. Uh-huh. I did it for a decade and many yeah. people love to do that. And then they can have their Etsy store or be in the community nights and weekends and do whatever they want. Cause I think it does. My values are freedom uh-huh. to live life on my terms. Somebody else's uh-huh. values might be stability and they think right. that's a paycheck. And that is, I am not judging you, but you're right. Something you shared with me uh, in your form was letting go of society's definition of success and happiness. But again, mm-hmm. I think this comes down to the conditioning and programming my wake up call was success and happiness was college, climbing the corporate ladder, retiring, what, at 65 and then dying. <laughs> and I just was, I wasn't happy. <laughs> so how, how can we, you know, unlearn and reimagine and, and be the architect and define our own success? Where do you even begin? Well, I think it is that whole proposition around really naming and getting clarity on our values. And I think another way we could think about it would be, I think we are conditioned to say, what am I going to get from life? What am I going to, I want to squeeze out. I want to have these experiences. I want to, I want to have success or, and we think like, what can life give to me? What can my relationships or this job? And it's very me focused Mm -hmm. Um, in my research and in my writing, I love to talk about not only like what we can get from life, but what we can contribute towards life. So um, in Worth the Risk, for example, it's almost like the JFK speech spinoff, like ask not what your country can, you know, it's like, don't ask what life is going to give you, ask what, like how you want to show up and what you want to give. So like, let's color it in. For example, let's say like so many of us have experienced excruciating loneliness. You know, lots of relationships have ended through the pandemic life cycles just lend itself to losing people. It could be through death, divorce, breakups, proximity, whatnot, right? So we all deal with like enormous loss. And even like um, you and I have talked about this before, like um, loneliness because we feel disassociated or disconnected to what we're, so, what we're being told we're supposed to be or have in our human experience. So we, I think we could have a lot of people around us and still also be very lonely and disenfranchised and feel disconnected from life. Um, And so to that end, I think trying to find community is really important. We know across the lifespan, for example, peer support is a really critical component of resilience and well-being. And like trying to find those niche places, like those affinities, you know, affinity groups, people that will understand us. It doesn't mean they all have to think and look and love like us or be, I don't mean like carbon copy bill. I just yeah. mean finding the community where we can, you know, appreciate ourselves more. And then, you know, so think about like, if say you're lonely and you want a relationship partner, you're like salivating. I want love. I'm going to go on the dating apps. I'm going to swipe, swipe, swipe my way to like happiness. And then, or, and then, you know, you just feel like so terrible after those experiences, because they're not often what you would hope they might be. Or let's say you have, let's say you have a brother and it's just a disappointment. It's not like what you see other people putting on Facebook with their brothers. Let's say like you just have a very conflictual or like a non-relationship or bad relationship. And you could just be like, oh my gosh, I would give anything to have, right? So I think we have to, if if we want love, like we wish we had a more loving brother, we wish we had a more loving partner, it starts with being love and recognizing the many forms of love that are in our life. So you might not have a brother that meets what you would wish for, but maybe you have a bestie or like a coworker or someone that's awesome and they are like a surrogate family to you, or maybe you don't have a relationship partner. And then, you know, you're like, Oh, unless I have a relationship partner, I always have to stand this like endless Nancy drew Harry Potter quest to find love. I'm like, always like 
on the search and on the hunt for this like elusive thing. And in the meantime, you could like embody love and be loving in how you show up and then see like what that brings about. Because I do think, you know, and obviously there's tons of discussion, laws of attraction, all those things that have become very popularized. But I think there's a lot of healing that comes with being what we want to receive. Okay. So I love that you just shared that and the energetics behind it. When you're in a state of loneliness and you go on the dating app, I love how Dr. Joe Dispenza says, you don't attract what you want. You attract what you are. Mm. And so again, if you don't have self-love, if you don't feel that and you're going out seeking for it, I, who else? Oh my gosh. I love this one. And some people think it's really dark, but I think he's amazing. It's Jigsaw. It's a Netflix special. Daniel Sloss is the comedian. So uh, do you know him, Daniel Sloss? I think so. I, I'm not good with names. Like, okay. then you're like he told this joke, then I'd be like, oh yeah. <laughs> but something he shares, and I just found the special, again, it's called Jigsaw. So relatable and honest because it's true. But he's like, if you only have 20% self love and you meet somebody and they show you 30% self love, you think that's love, but that's literally less than half. Huh. But again, in the societal thing, we are seeking somebody to, Jerry Maguire, complete me. Yeah, yeah. So until you are emanating, embodying love, wealth, happiness, but then I see it and have experience, then you are the magnetic force drawing those experiences to you. Mm. I think it's interesting. And we had talked before about brain pattern recognition too, right? And confirmation bias. So if you're in a situation where you believe the only form of love is in this like very specific precise prescribed way you could ignore like I think people could spend their whole life pining for this like ideal idyllic myth and then in the meantime miss like what you do have and that's you know you know I talk a lot about what is in my work yeah let's and that's a version of it like we can ignore what is and what is can really be like more than enough and be extraordinary mm. But how do we stop the, because I, I kind of hear what you're saying. And I actually literally asked this of one of my girlfriends yesterday, I'm, I'm dating and, and I went on a few dates recently with this guy, but of course, like I nitpick and I'm like, well, that is just not everything that I've dreamed of from Hallmark and all these movies. And so I straight asked her, I was like, do you think somebody can be brought into our life? And it's actually what we need and what we quote want, isn't going to fulfill that desire do you know what I mean mm -hmm. so let me just let me just ask so do you okay. mean um like you have this like conceptualization of what it should be but then yes. it's not really what but then do you feel like you're being too closed-minded or like do you feel like you're being too particular sometimes and even I mean I can talk to men and women about this I think again getting in our own way we think it's going to look like this yeah. But I think we need to be open to it looking like this. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. And so yes, I my eye, I'm very specific on what I'm attracted to and what I desire, but I'm also trying to train and be open to it coming in a different quote package. Yeah. I but I love it. I mean, even deconstructing package <laughs> because I Oh gosh, I've had like a disdain because you know, you hear that like, oh, you're the full package, like you're attractive, you're smart, like you're ambitious, right? And it's like all those like performance things across yeah. the gender spectrum. And I think each side, you know, each like piece on the continuum has different pressures and expectations that are indoctrinated. Um, so I do think just being mindful of being open around like why that could be brain recognition to that pattern recognition like oh yeah like this seems like I would pair well with this like person or whatnot and I know for myself I'm queer and I um you know I guess like I don't really like labels but you could say like bi or pan like that could probably be like an appropriate framing and I think it was helpful when I discovered it wasn't like I love like a specific gender. It was more like being attracted to someone's 
full self, their being, their soul, like who they are. So that was like a really helpful point in my own discovery, my own identity, in my own development. And I think the reason I share it is because I think we all have our versions of trying to figure out like what, you know, what we um, feel drawn to. And again, going back to values, like what do we value? And I think the dating world, I mean, I did like a whole comedy show, Love in the Time of COVID. And it was, I actually went on um, Bumble and I did this whole like research thing on Bumble. And it just makes me sad because obviously like we see it in social media, but then not everyone goes on dating apps, so they don't know, you know, um, it's, it can be pretty bleak. It can be pretty like transactional. It, and Empty. I felt like a lot of people were very defensive, like, because there's so much like that goes wrong, can go wrong and does go wrong. And it's like very wounded, you know, there's a lot of woundedness that you see evidence of. And I say all this, cause I think a lot, a lot of us just go through this and then it's like, oh my gosh, why, you know, th there can be shame around being single or having challenges in our relationships. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've served in therapy how many people I'm close with. I mean, like relationships are just so complicated and hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's another example of like, is there space to become more self-compassionate with ourselves and like really begin that process of, I know I don't like to sound trite, like self-love because that's like a hashtag everywhere we go, hashtag self-love and like da da da. But I think that um, we do have to value ourselves we have to value ourselves immediately, if not sooner. And <laughs> we have to see that value that we bring and want to contribute that and like let ourselves grow in into varied relationships and not feel like it has to be one set thing. Yeah. Because it's not that. Like you said, it's not going to be that. It's going to be different and hopefully it will surprise you in a good way. Yes. I have a question and then we'll need to wrap it up. On this brain recognition piece, because even, I mean, back when I worked in corporate and went from, I left one job and went to another, rather than trying to fit in a box and think what I needed, I actually just detailed um, my values or priorities. But whether we're talking relationships or maybe a home you want to live in or a job that you want to have, is it more important to focus on the feelings that you want to have rather than the way you think it should look? It's a is great question. Clear? It is. It's a really good question. I, I would probably like start with thinking about what makes for emotional regulation. And that's again, like the tending to the body budget. Lisa Feldman Barrett talks about this in her work, but it's that idea of like nourishing and, you know, fortifying ourselves with the things that we know do help human beings stay and do well. And then that, I think that anchor and then the anchor of our value set and on, on learning the, the foo and the community of origin stuff and the yeah. indoctrination that serves as a catalyst to then be better equipped to deal with. We talked about triggers today, right? It gives us that grounding, you know, and in my book, I talk about, you are not your automations. You are not your trauma. I talk about that. You are not these things that are provocative, but we're so much more. So I think when yes. we realize that, yes. that then serves as a great guide for us. I feel like, man, we just got started. I know. Um, since we did touch on so many different things today, is there one key takeaway you want listeners to get? Yes. So it is this, we are here to live a what is life, not a what if life. And what I mean by that is be present what, with what is possible, what is true, what you're good at, what you bring to life. And don't get caught up in the what if, well, what if the pandemic hadn't happened or I hadn't had this breakup or what if this new elected official comes in and we can live in a place of ruminating over the past or anticipatory anxiety. Live a what is life is focusing on what we can control, what's in our locus of control and leveraging that. I love that. Okay. To wrap up the interview, I'd love to ask you a few rapid fire questions. Yes. What is a quote or motto that you live by? Okay. I start with the risk with this Georgia O'Keefe. She said this, I've never, hold on. I have it here. If you really want the full reading, <laughs> um, 
I've been absolutely terrified every moment of my life and I've never let it stop me from doing a single thing I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Georgia O'Keeffe is a prolific artist. And for me as a person with a lived experience of anxiety, that quote just totally nailed it for me. Okay, next. <laughs> what is a book you're currently reading or highly recommend? Okay, I am obsessed right now with Trick Mirror. Um, Gia Tarantino, Tar Talentino. It's all about self-delusion, self-deception. It is. It won the Whiting Award. It is phenomenal. I'm loving it. It's just so enlivening and important. I recommend it highly. Awesome. All right. Final question. What advice would you give your younger self? To be playful, to not take yourself so seriously. Yes. Um, this might seem cliche, but like tr trust the process and that, yeah. you know, like your wondrous being embrace your weird. <laughs> Love that. And I hundred, I couldn't agree more. Dr. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, Heather. Thank you for having me.